Before we kick off today's episode, I'm excited to share our first live digital event, Winning with Ecosystems, on Thursday, July 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. In partnership with Tackle.io, the marketplace leader, and sponsored by Microsoft, this Microsoft Inspire After Party gives you access to executive insights, frameworks, and practical advice to take your Microsoft partner plan to the next level. You'll hear from Microsoft's esteemed leaders, top practitioners, and award-winning partners who will help you decode the opportunities of cloud go-to-market and ecosystem-led growth. Whether you're early to partnering with Microsoft or a seasoned expert seeking to drive scalable growth, this event is tailor-made for you. We guarantee that you'll leave with valuable insights, actionable strategies, and a plan to grow your business in fiscal year 24. Follow the link in the show notes to register today. I hope you'll join us for this amazing event. Welcome to the Ultimate Guide to Partnering. In this podcast, Vince Mincione, a proven industry sales and partner executive, brings together technology leaders to discuss transformational trends and to deconstruct successful strategies to thrive and survive in the rapid age of cloud transformation. And now your host, Vince Mincione. Welcome to, or welcome back to the Ultimate Guide to Partnering where technology leaders come to optimize results through successful partnering. I'm Vince Menzion, your host, and my mission is to help leaders like you unlock the leadership principles and learnings of the best in the business to get partnerships right, optimize for success, and deliver your greatest results. I find that technology organizations undervalue the power of brand and underinvest in marketing. If you want to learn from one of the best in the business, how to achieve high performance building brand with leaders like Microsoft, then you won't want to miss this episode. My guest for this episode of the podcast is Dux Raymond Sai, a dear friend and the chief brand officer at AppPoint. This is Dux's third visit to Ultimate Guide to Partnering. That puts him in rarefied air. And I asked Dux to come back to Ultimate Guide to Partnering to help you understand why brand storytelling and investing in marketing are critical to success working with the tech giant. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed spending time with Ducks Raymond Sai. Ducks, welcome back to the podcast. Hey Vince, thank you. Thank you for having me back. I'm so happy that buying you dinner worked. It was a really nice dinner, by the way. I really enjoyed that. But it, it was a virtual dinner, virtual dinner. Virtual that? dinner, that's right. Well, we haven't done the in-person events, just like we're talking about here. And I'm so excited to welcome you back to Ultimate Guide to Partnering. This is your third time back on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. You're, you're a three-timer now. And uh, I feel special. Am I a record holder so far? You're close. You're close. Well, we'll get, I think AppPoint as a whole is a record holder. How's that? Oh, thank you. Thank you. That, that, that's good enough. You me. guys are great. I love that point. We've got a long history working with you. And let's talk about you and your role, right? You're the chief brand officer for AppPoint. And now this three-time guest on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. You've had an exciting year. I mean, it's been a big year for AppPoint. And I was hoping we could catch up. So let's go. Thank you. And for those listening, it's a pleasure to be back. And for those I have not met, my name is Ducks. I'm the proud husband of Ramona and dad of two amazing kids. <laughs> As Vince mentioned, I serve as the chief brand officer here at AppPoint. AppPoint's the largest SaaS data management solutions provider for Microsoft 365. We essentially help companies around the world to collaborate with confidence, especially during this time of pandemic where everybody's jumping on the cloud. And my job is to lead AppPoint's brand strategy, brand experience, and brand value. And as Vince mentioned, it's been an exciting time for us. Last July, we became a publicly listed company after 20 years in business. Wow. That's amazing. 20 years in business and just went public. That's right. To some, it's been a while. We're not like a lot of the other tech companies out there where six months in business, they're public, but slowly but surely, it's, uh, it's definitely an exciting time and we're grateful. Well, you've done an astounding job building the brand at AppPoint. And I talk about this being a shiny quarter in a bucket full of shiny quarters and how it's difficult today. There are thousands and thousands of technology organizations that need to stand out and build a brand. We are in, you and I 
we both work in the Microsoft ecosystem. We know there's over 400,000 partners just in the Microsoft ecosystem alone. And so I was hoping today we would kind of dive in a little bit because you've done some really amazing work on building brand strategy and marketing. And so I was hoping you could share some of that with our listeners today. Absolutely. I'm more than happy to. And maybe we can start with the basics, right? What is brand? Some of us think of brand as a name, how people perceive you. But for me, the best definition of brand is from a brand strategist. His name is Fabian Gerhalter. And the way he describes brand is that brand is a service product company or person with soul that is attractive and smart. I love that definition. Let me repeat. Brand is a service product company or person with soul that is attractive and smart. I think that encapsulate, at least to me, what a brand should be. I love that. So I want to peel back on that a little bit, right? So he sure. talk, he's talking about soul. I'm thinking about, is that authenticity? It is. And it's that and among other things. So if we unpack that, so we think about soul, we think about authenticity and the reason why we exist. Because if you think about it from that perspective, it's essentially from a customer vantage point is why should people care about you? That's your soul. And that's true for a person. That's true for a company or a product. So if you think about your brand, why should people care about you? And being authentic is important. Being credible is important. It's answering the question, why do you exist? So it's your just cause. So I think about just cause. I think about when you yes. think about like, what is the reason? What is your reason for existing? Correct. Absolutely. And on one hand, we can talk about we exist because we have a great product that helps companies better manage data in Microsoft 365. That's okay, but that's not something that I would care about. So if I think about AppPoint, for example, we're, we're in this constant journey of making sure our brand is accepted. Our soul is to help organizations collaborate with confidence. Now, Microsoft is one ecosystem. There may be another ecosystem out there that people take advantage of, such as Google or Salesforce or what have you. But our reason to exist is we want to help organizations collaborate with confidence. So they're not concerned if their data impacted, if there's malicious activities that happen, be it ransomware or any other things. Or I want them to be confident when they move to the cloud. I want them to be confident that they're in compliant with regional restrictions such as GDPR. So what's the reason for your existence? So it's above and beyond features and functions. I think about Simon Sinek and his famous presentation right. on why, right? And so at the, the center, why, right? What's your why? Right. So at the center for you is collaborate with confidence. Absolutely. Yeah. So talk to me more about, like, okay, so attractive and smart. Like, how do you define those two? Sure. So we talk about soul is why do you exist? Now with attractive, right? Like, how do we make people feel? I think about the North Star for me as a chief brand officer. So I think about organizations like, like Apple, like BMW, right? Like the mere fact I mentioned the word Apple or BMW, hopefully yourself or the listeners out there, suddenly you, you, you felt something. Let's pick Apple, for example. The moment you first got introduced to Apple, you saw their ad, you touched their phone, you walk into an Apple store before pandemic, you call for help, you download an update. There's this sense of simplicity. There's this sense of consistency. And then there's this sense of luxury as well. When you think about Apple, it's so different than the car brand BMW, right? You feel as if you're special. That's the kind of feeling it evokes. So when you think about attraction and attractiveness, how does your brand make people feel? And it's a tall order, right? Because this takes intention. This takes a full on brand experience thinking. So it's not just marketing alone, right? So when I think about us as a company, Again, the moment somebody sees our website, calls to see a demo of our product, engages with our sales team, they buy our product, how do they like using our technology? So it, it's an end-to-end experience in making sure that people love it and they're attracted to it. So how do you infuse this into an organization, right? We can talk mm -hmm. about like advertising and slick ads for BMW and Apple, but that's not where it ends. That's just where it begins. I think about it's from the emotional connection. It's when you feel when you come in contact with a brand, 
So you're right. The ads are the first step, but then how do you carry it through? So as you may surmise, it's not straightforward and easy, right? So this is where we have to start thinking about marketing can't just be a silo within your organization. The common thinking is that, oh, we need marketing. We need ads. We need to be at an event. We need to put nice flicks out there. But elevating from that thinking is what would be the experience? Like it, it's all different than how we interact with people. So for example, Vince, the first time we met, I don't know if you recall this, uh, you were still at Microsoft. I think we met at a, a local event or Inspire, some public sector event, but I had a great first meeting with you. And then you followed up and then we had a call. So it's consistent, right? So it's not just that first interaction, but throughout the interaction, the conversations, the touch points has to go from, again, marketing to the end-to-end -end experience, which for me, it's a journey for any organization. I'm so excited to announce our continued partnership with AG1. Many of you know I made taking a green drink supplement, part of my health ritual for over 21 years now, and it has made all the difference to my health and well-being. Over six years ago, I found Athletic Greens, and now their product, AG1, became my go-to supplement. AG1 is the first thing I take every morning to power my day. It covers all of my nutritional bases, supports my gut health, gives a boost to my immunity and energy levels. If you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash Vince M. That's drinkag1.com forward slash Vince M. Check it out. So this is a great conversation and we've talked about two very visceral brands and we both work in this tech sector, this high tech sector. Many technology organizations, a lot of the organizations you and I know, they struggle here. They struggle with brand. They struggle with marketing just in general. So why do you believe that's so? That's a fantastic question, Vince. When I took on this responsibility, which I think this was a year ago now, really leading the brand strategy for AppPoint is I, I, I studied a lot of organizations, including ourselves. I think it comes down to three reasons why, especially tech companies struggle with building successful brand marketing programs. And I think the first one is, I alluded to this earlier, is marketing is often mistaken as secondary to sales or engineering. Case in point, and this is my experience as well in previous organizations where marketing is looked upon as, I hate to say this, but I have to be blunt, right? Like marketing is often hired help. Oh, let's get interns to do this. Or yeah, yeah hey, marketing folks, can you put a brochure together? Because I need for my presentation. Yeah. If you think about successful tech companies out there, such as Microsoft, Google, Amazon, guess what? Marketing is in the same playing field as sales and engineering. That's right. Equal playing field. It's clear. I think last year, Microsoft spent $20.2 on sales and marketing. It, it's critical. And I think that's the first reason why a lot of orgs struggle is putting marketing as a secondary priority. The second reason is a lot of organization, they, they surrender to the fact that, oh, we can't measure marketing, which I don't believe. Marketing, just like any other divisions, the organization should have measurable KPIs like sales and engineering. For example, here at AppPoint, right, when we measure different facets of marketing, so let me pick a couple of examples. So our field marketing organization where each business unit has a field marketing leader. So for example, Germany or France or U.S. public sector. There's a field marketing manager that sits side by side with the business and sales lead and say, hey, this is our target for this year. We need to get to X million dollars for this business. So the, the field marketer, along with the sales lead, would sit down, figure out, okay, what do we need to do to get to that number? What campaigns do we need to run? What account-based marketing strategy do we need to do? They're measured around the sales target. And then conversely, for our demand generation team, 
They're measured on how many leads that come, how much of those get converted, what's the marketing influence on business. And then on the brand side, we measure around what are the mentions we get from, for example, press or media. What's the click-through rates that we get based on the brand ads that we put. So point being is, just like any other discipline in the business, marketing should have measurable KPIs because oftentimes I hear from other organizations say, oh, it's hard to measure marketing. It's not, it's doable, but you have to put some metrics in place. That's the second reason companies don't put metrics around marketing. And third, now this may be controversial, Vince, but I think a lot of tech companies struggle to build successful marketing programs is they don't have anybody technical in marketing. So, so let me expand that further, right? Being a tech company, sure, we can hire marketers all day long, but at the very least, you need to have at least one person in there that's technical. And this is a lesson I've learned in the value I found since getting involved in marketing is being a ISV in the Microsoft ecosystem, having myself and a couple of my other colleagues that are technologists first, marketers second, we can be more authentic, we can be more credible, and then we can speak to things that are top of mind, not only with what the industry is doing, but also with what the customer needs. That way we can organize our messaging, our value prop, our go-to-market strategy that's technically sound. So it's not just, oh, what does he know? He's just a marketing person. And, yeah. and again, that's a common feedback we get. That's all. I'm a technical person first. I can still code. I can get up on stage at a technical event and talk all the technical stuff that people in the room would want to learn. That credibility is, is so valuable. You know, you talk about authenticity, right? So when you're technical and you understand the technology, you can simplify and transfer the value back to the customer because you know it intuitively at a deeper level than if I just gave you words on a page to read. A hundred percent. And frankly, the ecosystem and the technology is getting more sophisticated and complicated, right? A lot of customers these days, well, as much as I love to say they're hundred percent Microsoft cloud, well, they're not. In the movement towards a multi-cloud environment, which makes sense for customers, also brings in more complexity. And a marketing organization should be able to really, like you said, simplify that and message it in a way that would make sense to customer and still be true and credible and authentic. I want to ask you about like, how do you get people? Like, what is the skill set? So I, I look at you as a kind of a shining example, right? Somebody who has technical chops, but can translate it down to the most simple level for people to understand. How do you get good technical people into the marketing organization? I think so. I think about our company where, as I mentioned in our brand and marketing team, there are a good set of technical folks. I think here, is, here are the signs, right? Obviously the person is technical, but second is you can see people that are more engaged or, or I, I would say that would like to be talking to customers more, writing, being out there, be it publishing a blog or doing webinars, those are some characteristics of good marketers, at least in my opinion. So people who want to be more public, right? So that's one. Second is, I think technical folks that can, as you mentioned, Vince, that can simplify or tell stories, frankly. I think one challenge technical folks have is, and, and I'm guilty of this as well, from time to time is we assume people understand buzzwords and jargons and, and all the technical stuff, you know? but we need people that can take all the technical complexity, simplify it, and more importantly, tell it in a way that makes sense. And this is through storytelling, right? So that's the second characteristics that we want to identify in technical people to be good markers. I think the third part is somebody that's able to continuously learn new technical concepts as well. Because one caution I have is that I've met folks who are technical once upon a time, and then they moved over to the business side or the marketing side, and then they just gave up on being technical. And, and, and it's challenging, don't get me wrong. So even for myself, I try and carve out time to learn about what the latest and greatest is with Azure. So I geek out on some weekends and, and just start 
learning about cognitive services or what's new with Microsoft AI. So you need that person who still wants to constantly learn and keep up with technology. Yeah, sharpening the saw is the way I like to refer to it. So we have some skill sets that we don't normally transpose into a marketing organization. We do think about the people that are traditional marketers of the past. Let's talk more about those skill sets. Okay, so we need to be technical. We need to be able to tell great stories. And then ha we also need to be able to translate it, right? Create value. That's the most important part is I've got to be able to transfer that emotion that you talked about earlier back to the customer. How do you do that? So we've already tackled the technical bit, right? I think I, I want to focus on the next two things, the storytelling and uh, being able to communicate and transfer and convey information. So when you think about storytelling, right, it's, it's something we've discussed a lot. Vince and our good friend Mary wrote a phenomenal book around it. I love Miri's work. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about story, a brand story is really a cohesive narrative that covers facts and feelings that are created by your brand. And again, it has to be intentional. I can't think of an organization that has a brand story that, that just made, that, that, that was accidental or it was just ad hoc. In, in unlike traditional marketing or advertising, which is about showing and telling your brand, a story must inspire an emotional reaction. I know back in the day, the words emotions and inspire doesn't really come up when you think about tech marketing, but it's very critical these days because stories, by the way, is something that can stick more with people. I think there's a research that came out that you remember things 22 times more if you hear it in a brand story or in a storytelling fashion. Okay, some tips. So how do you think about stories? What are some of the common traits? You always start with problems. So I think about the, the cool thing with storytelling is it doesn't have to be complex. So for example, the way for us, the way we think about putting together a brand story or even some assets for our products or technologies, what are some of the core problems? So today during the pandemic, everybody's going to the cloud. So the challenge is around things like, how do I move? Once I move there, how do I better govern some of our investments in Microsoft 365? So start with some of the common challenges or problems. And then... Another common trait is how do you redefine an experience, right? So when I think about redefining experience, so when we start putting messaging together or stories together, we always talk about how do we make it easy to do the right thing for people or customers in Microsoft 365. So for example, I'm sure Vince, you are familiar with Microsoft Teams, right? Of course. Who isn't today? <laughs> yes. But one of the feedback we get from customers is that but there's so much to remind our uh, organization on what to do or what not to do in teams to be secure and safe. So what if we make it easy for people to do the right thing? What if there's a technology behind the scenes that would automate based on who you are, what you're doing, you'll take care of protecting, you, right? So you're redefining that experience. So that's a common trait of a story. And then the last thing is, I would say is if you want, a story to stick and be effective. It's always have something or someone visible in public. So it's no surprise that you see a Satya Nadella out there, a Steve Jobs. You see all these key people out there that represents their company, their story. And the same with that point, right? So I'm pretty much front and center out there. Jason, my colleague who leads our channel business is out there. So always have somebody visible. So, so that's something around that we have to think about with, with your story. So it's not just about telling a good story, but all these different common elements should be a part of it. Before we started, you and I were talking about this world we've been living through this age since the pandemic, and we're still not quite out of it the way we would hope to be at this point, the in-person events. We're all going, to, going through some fatigue. So there's a lot of ways, like when I think about you and Jason and your visibility, and we both use vehicles like LinkedIn, but mm -hmm. what are the other, what are the other, I'll call it methodologies, vehicles, like how do you think about holistically, once you've built that brand story, how do you convey it? What vehicles do you use to convey it? You bring up a good point, Vince, because oftentimes organizations or even people think about building brand is a transactional one-time event. Oh, let me tweet this, or let me write this blog, or let me speak at this event and I'm good, I'm done. No, just like anything else, it has to be consistent. So there are a couple of ways I would recommend organizations or people 
to carry on and be consistent with their brand. So first and foremost, especially in this day and age, you have to be active and involved in the appropriate social media channels. People always ask me, they're like, hey, should I be on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok? I go, where's your audience? So the first step you have to consider, or the first thing you have to consider is with your brand building exercise, what are you trying to do? Number one, are you promoting your company? Are you doing it for altruistic reasons? And once you figure that out, the second part is who's your audience, right? Because knowing who your audience is, you'll know where they are. So for at least my personal brand, and I'm sure Jason's the same, most of my audience is in LinkedIn and maybe Twitter. In fact, those two sets of audience are, are quite different as well. LinkedIn is primarily where uh, a lot of uh, the customers I work with are present. With Twitter, it's more on the industry peers and uh, industry folks. And knowing where your audience is, the third part is, okay, based on where your audience, what kind of content can you consistently share? And when I say content, you're not just randomly as best you can sharing stuff that everybody else is. You have to stand out. So a lot of the content I share is around how can you yeah. to be more productive. So I share a lot about things around productivity, life hacks, or I also share a lot of content around our industry, right? How can you better uh, use Microsoft 365? So you have to be intentional that people will learn and pick up stuff. And then you be consistent about it. I do use a lot of different tools and assets to convey all this information. So it's not just articles. Sometimes it's video. Sometimes it's presentations. And consistency is key. And then the last part I would say is to continuously communicate. You can only do so much in the digital space. You brought this up. People are just burned out or Zoom fatigue. So once the opportunity opens up, again, engage in a face-to-face -face setting, be it an event or a local meetup or a local user group. So, so those are just some of the things that we should do. And it's not the only thing, by the way. There's also a misunderstanding that, oh, when I start jumping on social media, I don't have to do this other branding or marketing activity that I used to do. You know, it, it's not an or, but it's an end. Really great points here. So I am listening. I'm a technology organization and perhaps I'm struggling here with what do I do next? Like maybe I don't have much of a marketing function today. What do you recommend for me? So what I would say, step one. So regardless, if you're a two-person organization, 10 people organization or a thousand people organization, you got to step back and think about as a business, your primary goal is to grow your business and make money. So, so you start with that. I would suggest that when you think about marketing, always tie it from a, how can marketing help drive my business? I mean, brand is important. Don't get me wrong. At least from my purview and what I've seen in a lot of organizations, we always start more around how can marketing help drive sales or business growth? So start with that. The second thing is look into opportunities where, especially these days, the barrier to entity marketing is so low. It doesn't mean you have to start hiring agencies. Like there's a lot of assets and resources out there on how you start thinking about how you generate leads. So for example, start with content marketing. It doesn't cost as much. You can start a blog or even start a webinar, start a YouTube video series on how to. Those are essentially low hanging fruit. Sure, you invest time and money, but you showcase your expertise as to what you do. Because as we all know, people want to buy, they don't want to be sold to. In, in fact, that's how I started in, in, in my previous company where I was a consulting organization. It was, we started as two people and we grew it to 30 people. I didn't have any marketing resources. So I went from the, I took the approach of how can I share my expertise so people will get to know me. And as they got to know me, they reach out to me and say, hey, Ducks, you seem to know a lot about SharePoint for project management. Can you come in and help us figure it out for our organization? So that's, I think, a good initial step. Certainly you're going to spend time and effort, but that way you're positioning yourself as a leader as uh, an expert in the field. And then from that, you can build upon your other marketing approach. Some really good and valid points here. I'm just thinking about our Microsoft ecosystem for a moment here. 
What advice would you have for the organizations today that might still be struggling? And I talked about the shiny quarters. What would you say to them to optimize for success this year? Yeah, for this year, first and foremost, you've got to be crystal clear with Microsoft's focus areas and KPIs. One of the great things that Microsoft offers, especially with their partner organization, there's tons of assets and tons of resources. So look at that on how you can take advantage of it and align with that as well, because other than resources, they've got incentives, not only from a corporate perspective, but also in the specific focus areas that they want to push, such as industry protocols or industry clouds. Another area that Microsoft's focus on is hybrid work. As we all know, people are trying to figure out how to go back to work. Teams is blowing up. Uh, Microsoft 365 and Dynamics is blowing up. See if you can align your practice with that and your marketing. With the second area of what partners can do as well is partner to partner. So as, as you mentioned, Vince, we just recently launched our channel program where, for example, we have opportunities for a partner, not only to work together and help our business grow together, but also co-marketing opportunities. So look at outside of Microsoft, what other partners you can work with and to do co-marketing and then jointly grow your business. And then the last part around marketing is, look, you gotta, in this be of noise where customers are just inundated with a lot of different offers and promotions and in webinars and what have you, you always have to go back to the basics. How can you stand yourself apart from everybody else? What's your unique value prop? And then take that value prop and look at all the different marketing approach and marketing vehicles to promote that. Some really great advice. I really like what you had to say about partner to partner, by the way, because I do think that in the ecosystem, the seats at the table, we tend to just think about our own organization, but they're the other seats at the table. The customer's thinking about implementing a whole solution and having the influence in the relationship to drive your brand through others is, as well is such a powerful force. Absolutely. I mean, if you just do the math, right? So what uh, Microsoft is a two, last I checked, two trillion dollar business. That's and, crazy. And the last that was what? For every dollar that a customer spends, they spend $9 for partner solutions or services. So you do that math, nine times two, that's $18 trillion industry. The pie is just so big that there's no reason why partners shouldn't join forces and, and work together and, and grow together. While we're on the topic of Microsoft, it seems like a hundred years ago, but it was just a couple months ago that we were all at Inspire. And I wanted to get your perspective because you got to be the boots on the ground, the reporter at the event, covering the event. So I want to get your personal experience, what that was like, and then also talk a little bit more about what are you seeing and how does it feel in the room and the announcements that were made? Now, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be in studio for that virtual Inspire. Again, nothing beats in-person Inspire, but we make the most out of what we can during this time and with technology. So I was up there in, in Redmond in uh, Microsoft Studio. So had a blast and boy, it's a full on production. It's like a two day TV show between wow. having hosts and segments and sessions. There's a lot of energy. So a lot of folks behind the scenes doing the broadcast and streaming. And then I think there's that continued sense of inspire excitement and optimism as they had back when we would used to go to Vegas. So the industry is growing, the opportunities abound for partners. And for me, three key announcements or three key things that stood out for me. Number one, the slashing of the marketplace fees for partners. They used to charge 20% transaction fee. Now it's down to 3%. So Microsoft's really being aggressive on wanting partners to get engaged in their marketplaces, yeah, especially I, having a, a huge partner ecosystem. I don't know if you talked to partners about this announcement that they made. Well, it was very telling. And we've had Sanjay on, Sanjay Mehta from Tackle.io on talking about this whole ecosystem. And other guests have been talking about it as well. I mean, it was a very telling announcement that Microsoft is serious about marketplaces. And then the, the second thing is around their industry clouds, right? So having... One of the top, I would say, if not the top 
cloud platform globally, but now they're really zeroing in on different industries. Obviously, they started with public sector. Now they have healthcare. And now I think at Inspire, they announced their cloud for sustainability that helping organizations to re record, report, and reduce their emissions toward net zero. I think, again, to some, this is way out there, but it makes sense. And really, it aligns with their commitment to a lot of the work they're doing for sustainability. So I think that was huge, right? The continued investment on industry cloud. And then yep. the last part is around the hybrid work and future work with the continued growth of Microsoft 365 and the deeper integration with Dynamics, where it opened up opportunities for partners to build collaborative apps for employee experience like Microsoft Viva, right? And also the announcements of Windows 365. So, so really Microsoft is leading the charge on what the future of work looks like. So to me, that's exciting. And as a partner in that space, tons of opportunities. Yeah. And the street reacted, right? We've seen the stock price go up. I mean, it's quite telling mm. what's happening with Microsoft. And we've also had Bob Evans on from Cloud Wars talking about the three hyperscalers and how they come at it differently. But Microsoft's approach right now, I think, is telling. I think it's an exciting time for sure for all of us in the ecosystem. Absolutely. So, Ducks, I'd like to have a little fun here. I've been really digging Spotify. I mean, I still have Apple and I use that, but I like the Spotify ability to share playlists and building the building some of my own playlists lately. And I was wondering, like, if you had only if you could only pick five songs and this would be your only playlist for the foreseeable future, right? Think about this for a second. You may be stuck on a desert island. We'll think castaways here. Or just, this is the only songs you're going to listen to for a period of time. What would those five songs be and why? Only five songs? Only Man. five songs. All right. You Two, In the Name of Love. Nice. Michael Buble, Home. I love that song. Nice. nice. It reminds me when I was traveling a lot and I would hear that music. I can't make it go home. Those long flights. Exactly. And uh, I'm into Bossa Nova, so I would say... One Note Samba, especially the one that this singer covered. Her name is Siti, S-I-T-I. -I. I don't her. I don't. I'm looking her up now. Siti. She did a cover on One Note Samba. Very good. So that's three, right? Okay, so that's three. three. Yeah. Yeah. You got two more. Dancing in the Moonlight. It's a new version of this. It was done by, I don't know if I'm, I'm saying the name right, but Jubel, J-U-B-E-L. I'm, I'm stuck on this song. Oh, wow. I love that song, too. I can't wait to listen to this one. This is a cool, chill-out version, but it's very cool, very nice. And then there's this one musician I've been listening to. It's from He's from Australia, and it's more of a, I don't know, maybe more of EDM, but the song is called Descent, D-E-S-C-E-N-T. Descent. And the artist, yeah, and the artist is Oliver, but it's spelled as O-L dot V-E-R. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we're going to post these. We're going to put this playlist together and post it along with the episode for our listeners. So everybody could Fantastic. Pull down, we could all pull down this music. I can't wait to listen, Ducks. I'm really excited about this. So I love what we had to say today. You, first of all, I just love you. You're like such a great guy. I mean, such a great individual, authentic, real, just a great friend. And I just want to thank you for that. And Oh, Vin, thank you. I love you too. Thank you for all the support and uh, really all the love through the years. Well, it's real. And I, I just love working with you. And I can't wait to be in person again. Like we were talking about this earlier, right? Like have, just get some time together, break bread, do a, not do virtual dinner. Let's do a real dinner. I can't wait to do exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. But I want to thank you again for being so generous with your time. You, I know how compact and compressed your schedule is. And so I, I love having you back here on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. I'm going to have you back again at some point. And I want to thank you for being such an amazing guest. I love what you had to say today, especially on some of the topic of brand and marketing that some of our listeners really need to have. Awesome. Well, Vince, thank you. All the best and definitely looking forward to see you. Thanks again, Doug. As with each of my episodes, I appreciate your support. Please subscribe on your favorite platform, like, comment, tell your friends about Ultimate Guide to Partnering and where they can find us. And I'd love your feedback. Please like the podcast and provide comments or reach out to me at Vince Menzion on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. 
You can also like and follow Ultimate Guide to Partnering on our Facebook page or drop me a line at vincem at ultimate-partnerships.com. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Ultimate Partnerships. Ultimate Partnerships helps you get the most results from your partnerships. Get partnerships optimized for success, deliver results. For more information, go to ultimate-partnerships.com. I'm excited to share our first live digital event, Winning with Ecosystems, on Thursday, July 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. In partnership with Tackle.io, the marketplace leader, and sponsored by Microsoft, this Microsoft Inspire After Party gives you access to executive insights, frameworks, and practical advice to take your Microsoft partner plan to the next level. You'll hear from Microsoft's esteemed leaders, top practitioners, and award-winning partners who will help you decode the opportunities of cloud go-to-market and ecosystem-led growth. Whether you're early to partnering with Microsoft or a seasoned expert seeking to drive scalable growth, this event is tailor-made for you. We guarantee that you'll leave with valuable insights, actionable strategies, and a plan to grow your business in fiscal year 24. Follow the link in the show notes to register today. I hope you'll join us for this amazing event.